Hey everybody, good morning. Welcome to Transform Church Michigan. We are so excited to be in a building today doing our first service in our new space. If you're here this morning, that means that you're searching. And that means that this is the perfect place for you. Because we are looking for the people who are searching so that we can help you find the answers and find that thing that you're searching for. Remember today that it is okay to not be okay, but it is not okay to stay that way. And that's what we are about here at Transform, transforming from not okay into okay, and then into thriving and doing very well. So if you're looking for some help with that, reach out because that's why we're here. There's no pressure here. We intentionally stay away. If you want to reach out to us, we are totally friendly and we're totally approachable. We just let you do that at your pace and you feel comfortable. All are welcome here to learn about Jesus, exactly where you are. Just know that we are about lifting people up, building each other up, not tearing each other down. We are not here to cause problems with each other. We are not here to stress people out. Here at Transform Church Mission, we are about teaching, equipping, reaching, and healing. That is our mission. We want to join you on your journey, and God is calling you to immerse yourself in the worship experience this morning. So set aside your preconceived notions, set aside all that baggage, and join us as we worship Jesus. So we're rolling into the Christmas season. And here at Transform Church Michigan, the people that God uses to run this building to make this worship experience happen for you, we understand at this point what the Christmas season is all about. We know why it's something to celebrate and why we should have so much joy because of what, we're, what it is. But I know that you may not know that. I know that there was a point in time when I did not know that. And no, it wasn't when I was a child. But when I was an adult, I didn't fully grasp it. And it took a, quite a while, even after God uh, called me back to him and I reconnected with him and started walking with him again before I fully understood so today, before we start our Christmas series, I'm going to hopefully help you to understand why the Christmas season is such a joyous season to be in. Help you to understand why it is a big deal when we get to December 25th. Today's message is called Growing with God, Rebirth. It's accepting the truth and transforming in response. So God tells us that we are not good. And this is not a bad dog routine. It's not smacking you on the nose with the newspaper saying, hey, you suck. You're totally bad. No. It's understand all of us, including myself, are not good. No one. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Not just some and not some ones have fallen more than others. Everyone has fallen short of the glory of God. We are all born into sin. And these are facts given to us by the one and only God. So let's start this journey by looking at scripture. I just cited four verses starting with Mark chapter 10 verse 18. Which reads, Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. Romans 3.23 For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Isaiah 43.10-12 tells us about this one and only God. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe in me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me there is no Savior. <clears throat> I have revealed and saved and proclaimed, I and not some foreign God among you. And we see that this passage from Isaiah tells us that this is the one true God. It tells us there is no salvation except through him. That's why Christians can boldly claim that without Jesus you are not saved. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one gets to God except through Him. Because the Bible says so. Because God says so. 
So let's start thinking about why we are not good. And in order to begin this step on the journey, we're going to roll all the way back to Genesis. And we're heading back to Genesis because this is where it all begins. Christians raised in the faith can grow tired of this book, but this book is absolutely vital to our understanding of the rest of Scripture. The book of Genesis, especially the first 11 chapters, are quoted from or referred to in the rest of Scripture more than any other book. There are at least 200 quotations or references to Genesis in the New Testament alone. That includes many times when Jesus himself quotes or references this book. So we would be smart to value this book if we want to know God, follow Christ, and have the truth rooted in our hearts. These references and quotes speak to the validity and trustworthiness of the Bible as every human New Testament writer used by God refers in his writings to the first 11 chapters of Genesis, every single one. And that's why Genesis is the foundation upon which we build our faith. Because if Genesis isn't true, then Jesus himself is a liar, and the rest of the Bible cannot be trusted. And there are many pieces of evidence and great arguments that support the truth of Genesis. I'm going to give you just a taste of it this morning. And it's hopefully enough for you to open up and listen to what God has to say in the rest of his word today. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 through 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Science uses five words to talk about the universe. Time, space, matter, power, and motion. All five of these terms are used in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 2, dating back to 1450 B.C., approximately. B.C. meaning before Christ. In the beginning, beginning time, God created power, the heavens, space, and the earth, matter. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over motion, the waters. All five terms that science uses to describe reality are used right there. So, it's going to be really hard for somebody to tell you that the Bible and Christianity is unscientific because this is just one place out of many where God's Word establishes scientific truth before science discovered it. Quote, unquote. The rest of Genesis 1 tells us about the six 24-hour days during which God created all things. And what we want to pay attention to here today is that God repeatedly called his creation good. When God calls it good, he calls it perfect and good according to his standard, not according to our standard and our understanding. And God calls it good... In Genesis 1.4, 1.10, 1.12, 1.18, 1.21, 1.26, 1.27, 1.28, 1.29, 1.30, 1.31, 1.32, 1.33, 1.34, 1.35, 1.36, 1.37, 1.38, 1.39, 1.40, 
God specifically gave Adam freedom with only one restriction. Do not do this one thing. After God told Adam about this, he created Eve to be Adam's wife. Now at this point, everything is completely made and everything is good. Keep that in mind. Genesis 3 is a world-changing moment. This chapter here explains why there is death, pain, and suffering in the world. So when you wonder why children are hurt, if you wonder why good people or innocent people are harmed and die, we've already talked about how God says no one is good. As hard as that is to believe, because we don't want to think that a newborn baby is not good. But the truth from God is that the newborn baby is not good. It is born into evil. It is born into sin. So now that we have the basis for what is good, and we have our first picture of love, when God made mankind to live in close relationship with him in the Garden of Eden, and gave us the choice to live or die. Satan uses the most common way that we talk ourselves into sin and out of obedience. It can't really be that bad. It can't really be that big of a deal. Dad's got to be blowing it out of proportion again. So here's the icing on the cake of lies that Satan has baked. What you're thinking is right. Your father's being ridiculous and extreme. You won't die. See, God has secret knowledge and special privileges. He just wants to control you and keep you from experiencing life. Your father doesn't want you having any fun. Eve thinks to herself, I want the fruit. It looks so good. I want freedom. What God's giving me is a freedom. This isn't good enough. He's hiding something from me. I'll also become smarter if I eat it. And that's not bad, right? Wisdom is good. And if God loves me, there's no way he's going to let me die. So she eats the fruit. It, look, so she eats the fruit and gives it to her husband. Now she has done something that she knew she wasn't supposed to do and brought somebody else into it. Which makes you wonder, why couldn't she just eat the fruit by herself? Why did she have to drag somebody into it? Because misery loves company. Because sin has to infect others like a disease because we have guilt on the inside that tells us that what we're doing is wrong. And in order to try to quiet that guilt, tap it down, is we got to drag everybody around us into that and get them to not only tolerate what we're doing, but say it's good and it's okay. You do you. YOLO. And that's how sin corrupts everything. Because it, you can't just have it to yourself. You gotta bring everybody else into it. The rest of Genesis 3 tells us about how Adam and Eve knew they did the wrong thing and tried to hide it from God when he came back around. It also tells us about the curse that God placed on mankind and the earth. But it also tells us about how God is going to bring us back to him. God begins the curse by stating that evil will be at odds with mankind and the descendant of the woman will completely defeat Satan while Satan will only injure him. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all of the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Now the truth hurts when you first hear it and when you first say it. All the brokenness in the world entered through woman. But all of the completion of restoring things back to God is coming through a woman. This is the first prophecy of Jesus coming in human form, and it's the reason why we celebrate Christmas. The rest of the chapter explains how the curse affects mankind, but in the closing moments, when God 
made clothing from animals for Adam and Eve, we see how the shedding of blood is necessary to cover up sin. How it's required to pay the debt of sin. And it is because of the first sin that we are all born inherently sinful. It is because of the first sin that none of us are good, not even one. Psalm 51, 5 reads, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. And the Apostle Paul writes in one of his letters to the early church, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature, by nature, deserving of wrath. By who we are, even existing, we are deserving of wrath. By fulfilling what our nature, our sin nature, desires, we deserve wrath. And that is where God's grace comes in. That is the huge reason why we have joy, hope, and peace all of the time, but especially during the Christmas season. Because God is bigger than our flaws. All of us. That is the reason why this season is such a big deal to celebrate. Because God loved you so much that he gave his only son to suffer and die. To pay the debt of your sin even while you were still a sinner, even while you shook your fist at him, spit in his face, and treated God like he was nothing by using his name in vain. By living your life as if God doesn't exist, even while you did that, he still did for you. He still showed his love for you. And that is why God and Jesus deserve the glory. That is why we have the hero. That is why we celebrate this season. Because his love is so much bigger than us. And there's nothing we can do to earn that salvation. Because the only thing we can do is sin. Without God. Without turning to him and asking for that change asking to be born again because we were dead in our sin. We can't ever do anything besides sin. The great message of that gift of salvation from Jesus is that you have the opportunity to have eternal life with God. None of us will ever begin to grasp how amazing and awesome this fact is of God's love and his actions to save us until we stop denying the truth about ourselves. It starts with the man in the mirror, the woman in the mirror, not pointing your finger at everybody else, not saying, yeah, I have sin and it's over here, but their sin's worse. That's not how you grow. That's not how you change. We have to accept that we are not good. That we are all flawed. That our very body is born into sin, desire, evil, without God. That is the way to freedom. We need God to wake us up. 
And it is unreasonable to expect God to do anything in our lives while we deny his truth. It is unreasonable to say, why didn't God save me from this when I was committing the sin? It's unreasonable to blame the devil for the things that go wrong in our lives when we're walking around holding that stick, riding a bicycle, and that stick is our sin. And we bend down riding that bicycle of life and stick it in the front spoke, flip off, break our arm, break our leg, and we're sitting here on the side of the road, bleeding, dying. Why is the devil doing this to me? It's unreasonable. We have to wake up to that. We have to accept God's truth and let it change us. So as we head into prayer and our closing music, I want to let you know that once the closing music is over, you are welcome to leave, or if you want to leave during the uh, closing music, that's fine. You'll want to exit to the left of the worship zone. After the music is over, we will be opening up the donation center. And if there's anything on, on those shelves that you need, feel free to take it. No judgment if you leave before the music is over. Those shelves are closed until after the music is over, and one of our helpers is able to go over there and open it up. With that being said, I invite you to join me in prayer. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for opening our eyes and our hearts to your truth. Thank you for a space where we can safely and legally be able to learn about you. Thank you for a space where we can grow, for people that are part of our community to help us grow and to honor you and to know you better. Thank you for your patience, your mercy, your love. I pray that you would help all of us to accept the truth of your word, the truth of who you are in our life today. And I pray that you would protect every single person here and bless them as they go about this week. In your awesome and holy name, all God's people said. Amen. If you want to stick around and you need to talk to anybody for prayer, there is me. You can come up and talk to me once we're completely done. Let me know if you need prayer or if you'd like to talk about making the next step in your journey or beginning your journey with Jesus.